And he's internationally known as the Supermax. Would you welcome Lee Trevino? You hustle, I guess. It pretty well says it, doesn't it? Well, I think a lot of people uh, misinterpret the word hustle. How would you uh, define it? I, you? I just, uh, there's, there's a sucker born every day, you know? <laughs> that's, that's how I define it. Golf really is a game where the rules were laid down 400 years ago, how to behave and what to do and what not to do. And along came this man who did things his way. Playing in big tournaments, it's not a lot of pressure. When you're standing there with an eight-foot putt to win 90,000, mm. you know if you miss it, you're going to win 47,000. <laughs> now, uh, you know, that, that's a hell of a feeling. <laughs> he was a guy who laughed and smiled and did silly things on the golf course, which uh, you don't do. Can we go back and start again? <laughs> he wears all of his emotions on his sleeve. He shows you the happiness, the care, the feeling, and that's natural for him, and uh, has made him an endearing character. I, I really don't. I'm a little short guy. <laughs> Someone once said that Lee Trevino took the, the game of golf from the corporate boardroom in the country club to the parking lot, and people sensed that about this guy, and he, he was really one of us. Turkey time right here. This little car right here. Damn, was pretty. A little crazy. He's talking while he's playing. I mean, he's at the top of his backswing one day and he's saying, you know, my wife lost her credit card and he's looking at the hole and he's getting ready to hit and he says, I hope somebody else finds it. And he hits the ball and he says, because if somebody else finds it, they can never spend what my wife spends. <laughs> There's, you don't have to talk with Lee because uh, he's, he's going to do all the talking anyway. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Then I yesterday. That's his release of nervousness. If that bothers you, then you better be walking down the other side of the fairway. If it doesn't bother you, then you go play. I reckon if you'd have put a tape across his mouth uh, and stopped him from talking, he would have just blown up. When he pulled into the parking lot and walked onto the grounds, he was on. He was an entertainer. Anything can happen with me, I tell you. I'm looking at him falling in a leak out I don't think people know that he's a man who tends to, after his round, after five hours of making galleries laugh, he's a man who wants to go be by himself. I think he might be out having a few beers in public and laughing it up and joking it up. Uh, not Lee's style at all. He'd never leave the room and all, the, all these trays would be in front of the room and you hear the television going, you know? I don't know what he did in there. Maybe he was writing his lines for the next day. I don't know. I just think he goes time out. I'm actually going to get some downtime because you can't maintain that pace all of the time. And part of that is because of the trap he set for himself in his public persona, in that if he ever went to a restaurant, well, everybody thought, there's my buddy Lee. People are hanging on you for so many years that you do what you have to do, and then once it's done, you, you turn it off. I don't remember him ever taking us to movies. You know, we just couldn't really do anything with Dad because we'd just get mobbed. I actually went for some help on this because I was getting very, very edgy with this. And the conclusion was, just for that one moment, they're in your shoes. They're part of you. The world was ready to embrace and to love Lee Trevino, and he didn't quite want it. He was uncomfortable with his background because Clearly, it was a background that did not develop any great social skills. Born in 1939, Trevino grew up poverty-stricken in a remote section of North Dallas. They was way out in the country. They, I mean, they, were, they were in the housing a mile or two. Dirt floor shack, uh, no electricity, uh, no running water. He did not have changing clothes. They had to wash your clothes out overnight to be clean the next day. Never knew his father. Uh, was raised by his grandfather, who was a grave digger, and his mother. His basic education uh, was not a formal one. He went to the uh, Dallas public schools for eighth grades and then dropped out. Never had a childhood? 
I've worked ever since I can remember. At age eight, Trevino began working as a caddy. By 15, he was scoring in the upper 70s, winning tip money from his colleagues. So I think he beat the ball around a little bit, and I think he, uh, you know, had his experiences with golf, playing with other caddies. If you didn't go out there and play golf for a quarter, and they said, come on, man, what are you, scared? You scared of your mom? Huh? You scared of your granddaddy? You scared to lose? It was all peer pressure. He act more like a man instead of a kid want to rip and run all the time, you know, and want to be wild. Realizing he was heading down the wrong road, Trevino joined the Marines at 17 and became a machine gunner stationed in Japan. The very first uh, night, they made some wisecrack, and uh, uh, this uh, Marine sergeant get responded by just uh, smacking him in the mouth <laughs> and, and said, uh, I talk, you listen. The Marines did uh, one thing for him, made him very disciplined. And it, I think, simplified his life a great deal and gave him a sense of purpose, a sense of self-worth that he never had before. I re-enlisted and went back to Okinawa. On the ship, my orders got messed up. The captain said, do you play a sport? I said, I play golf. So he picks up the phone and he says, I got a guy up here who says he plays golf. He says, you mind taking him out to the golf course, he says, and see if he does. And if he does, I'm going to leave him here. He can go on the golf team. So I went out and I shot 78, 67. That was my amateur training. I played for the third main division golf team. And that's what I did seven days a week for two years. Due to the clerical mistake, Trevino's life took an unexpectedly sharp dog leg for the better. I probably wouldn't have proceeded to play the game. I wouldn't have had the chance to because I would have stayed the four years. I would have ended up in Vietnam. I probably would be dead or in prison. got a lot of gambling. There's a lot of people ready to gamble and eat. They play uh, gin romy, they play back gambling, and they pay golf. There's a golf course in Dallas, Texas called Tennyson Park. Every hustler, every wheeler dealer, every guy trying to fake his way into a quick buck plays golf at Tennyson Park. There was a, a lot of money floating around that course on any given day. If you think making a three-foot putt to win the U.S. Open is pressure, try playing at Tennyson East Municipal in Dallas when you got a $5 bet and you've only got a quarter in your pocket. Born to play at Tennyson, Trevino developed a hustler's reputation. I teed it up for five, but that's all I had. If you lost, you were broke. And uh, that's as much pressure as betting 100 or 500 or 1,000. But he really didn't hustle nobody for no money. They always come to him and want to bet him. If you want to call it hustle because I shot 66 all the time, then that's a hustle. After beating everyone at Tennyson, Trevino looked to turn pro. A local driving range owner, Hardy Greenwood, gave him the job that would allow him to eventually apply for membership in the PGA. But when Lee asked his boss to sign his application, he was turned down. Hardy said, you still need to settle down, Lee. You've got to get some foundation and stability in your life. And then when I see that, then I'll sign this application. And that's when I decided that I had enough time. I had the four years under his belt. I told him what he could do with his job, and I quit. No pro in Dallas would sign his card. He was on the wrong side of the tracks, he was a minority, he was poor. I still am very bitter about it, but I've learned a long time ago that you have to forgive, but you don't necessarily have to forget. Shortly thereafter, he had the opportunity to play some uh, games out in El Paso for some uh, deep pocket uh, cotton farmers. They loved to gamble. And one of them, uh, Martin Lutnich, he'd take 
me as a pro, all the pro local pros, and try to beat this Gene Fisher and Fred Hawkins. Couldn't beat them. And so this one of our members said, I know a little Mexican boy that works at a driving range down in Dallas. If you give him a plane ticket, he'll come down here and play. Well, nobody thinks that a, that a Mexican can play. I said, let's get him. And the telephone rings. And I said, hello. He said, oye, chico. He said, and he starts speaking Spanish to me. And I told him that he could have 10% of the action, plus he, whatever he could make, and uh, everything was paid. The guy comes walking across the parking lot, and he had an old greasy hat on of some sort, and he looked like a damn tractor driver. We go up the tee box, and Lee says, uh, mucho gusto, you know. The assumption is this guy can't speak in English much. Lee and Martin would just whip him and collect all the money, and then go drink beer. <laughs> Got my $300, I came home. Martin called me again. He said, listen, he said, why don't you pack up everything? He says, and just come on out here. He said, we'll find you a job. Still with no PGA card and no prospects of getting one in Dallas, Trevino headed out to West Texas in 1965. There was a pro here in El Paso by the name of Bill Eschenbrenner. And he took Trevino after he saw him play, and he told him, Lee, I want to help get you on the tour. No one had come out of the municipal ranks and played like Lee Trevino. He didn't grow up in the right standards. I mean, he was a caddy, you know, and he was rough, and he was tough, and they didn't feel like he would make a good PGA member. They weren't trying to get numbers in the PGA. They were just getting kind of selective people. I, I wasn't smart enough to realize what they were doing that it was that I was Mexican-American. Eschenbrenner started writing to uh, the PGA and, and backing him up and endorsing him and trying to certify him. Still, nothing would happen. I thought, well, there's got to be a way we can get around this. And, and so therefore, I thought, well, maybe I can sign it. So finally, what Eschenbrenner did, he was so impressed with Trevino, he actually went to a meeting of the PGA in fact, I even told him down there, I said, well, then you can take my PGA card if he doesn't make a great PGA member. And that did it. And that did it. If he'd have stayed in Dallas and they'd never let him have a card, we'd never seen Lee Trevino. That would have been a crime. Still waiting to get his PGA card at 26, Trevino faced a Texas-style challenge. After Lee had been here a little while, Titanic Thompson called us, wanted to bring a kid named Ray Floyd, and they thought they could beat Lee. Titanic said, have you ever heard of Trevino? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, uh, well, would you play him golf for money? And I said, I'll play, I'll play anybody I haven't heard of. So Floyd comes in and uh, he gets off the plane and comes to Horizon City and gets out of the car. And here's this little Mexican kid comes out and takes the clubs out of his trunk. Lee was the everything. He was the golf pro. He was the clubhouse attendant. He was chattering the whole time. By the way, he said, who am I playing today? I said, you're playing me, Mr. Floyd. He said, you? They asked Floyd, do you want to play around first to get a feel of course? No, if I want to play him, I don't need any practice. And they had a pretty good bet going. Uh, it was a Nassau bet. And Lee won all three ways the first day. So the next day, Floyd shoots a 66. Trevino shoots a 65 again <laughs> and cleans out everybody. And he wants to play nine more holes. And I said, Mr. Floyd, I said, I, I can't play nine more holes. I said, I, I got to put the cards up. He said, not only am I playing the shoe shine guy, he said, I'm playing the cart man, too. So I go back the third day, and we are tied. The last hole's a par five. He made about a 20-foot eagle putt on 18, and I missed about a 15-footer for an eagle on 18. And Raymond grabbed his ball, and I said, adios. That was enough for me. In 1966, Trevino played on his first US Open, finishing 54th with an unmatched set of clubs. A year later, he qualified again for the Open at Baltusrol, 
This time, he came in fifth. That's Lee Trevino. All dressed up in green shirt and brown pants for the final round of the U.S. Open. Last year, he won $600 in total prize money. Here was a little fella, a Mexican-American out of West Texas. Nobody heard of him, dressed funny. And here he finishes in the top 10 in the U.S. Open coming from nowhere. We thought uh, Torino playing well in 67 was something of a fluke. You know, it's easy to get in the Open, hard to play well. And we thought he'd play well and go away, but that was not the case. Torino won $26,000 and was Rookie of the Year. Then at the 1968 U.S. Open, he demonstrated that he was not only for real, but here to stay. At Oak Hill, all of a sudden there's this guy winning the U.S. Open, and I thought, wait a minute, what is this? It became really surprising that uh, he played that one. This young man is on the brink of one of the most sensational sports stories ever. After sinking the putt at 11, Trevino pulled away from Bert Yancey. On 18, he needed a par to set a U.S. Open record of four rounds in the 60s. And I had like 176 yards to the hole. Kevin says, what are you doing? I pulled a six iron out of the bag. I says, I'm going to knock this on the green. He says, you can't get it out of there. I said, I am not going to be remembered as the 68 U.S. Open champion that laid up on 18. the ball up and out of the rough, and he must have a, a very difficult third shot to play now. He took the six iron and handed me a wedge. <laughs> I swung so hard at this wedge, and the ball came out perfect. What a great shot, Chris, that he played out of that. Boy, oh boy. Some of the crusty old veterans in the uh, locker room as the uh, victory was coming about, and they were kind of saying, I'm not sure this is a great thing for our tour. You know, he wasn't the gentleman that uh, Yancey was or that Nicholas is. You know, he was always clowning around. And I'm sure that the USGA, knowing them, were not uh, delighted by that. There's the man of the hour, Lee Trevino. Listen. Walking up the bowels of that hole, he put his arm around one of those blue-coated USGA officials, Joe Dye. His exact words said, what are you trying to do, win the U.S. Open? And I said, whether you like it or not, you got a Mexican for a U.S. Open champion. <laughs> this is for a par four. Here is your United States Open champion. But it, it means a great deal to me, not ever winning a golf tournament, and especially the United States Open. This is the greatest golf tournament in the world, and I'm proud to win it. What was beautiful about it was uh, he, he broke the Open record. He had just put his game up sort of on display, see what happened, and, and, and he found out that I'm as good or better than a lot of these guys. Anybody that finishes fifth one year and then wins the Open the next year obviously can play. He could play more shots uh, than almost anybody I ever saw. It'd be pretty hard pressed to find a better shot maker that is a contemporary of mine. I think he's the best shot maker in my era. Prods it along the ground up the bank. And good Lord, look at that one. There were only two guys that hit the ball better through the bag, and that was Ben Hogan and Sam Snead. He's one of the very few players that could actually tell you what he's going to do before he does it. But well, here we are, the sun has just come up. We're on the practice team. Watson looks over and he says, say Max, show me something. Hit the 100 yard sign. Trevino says, that ain't nothing. Which part of the sign do you want me to hit? Watson says, the right zero. I'm telling you, first shot hits the zero right in the middle. Laughed and cackled and he says, it doesn't take long to warm up a Rolls Royce. A lot of guys would play the shot on Tuesday on a practice round, but wouldn't play it on a Sunday when it meant something. Lee was totally fearless when it came to playing shots that fit the occasion. Part of his confidence came off the practice tee. 
You want to be a good golfer? <laughs> Do what Trevino did. He would hit every day, including Saturday and Sunday, a thousand golf balls. Then he'd go out and putt for an hour. And then he would go out and play 18 holes every single day. I'm just watching him hit him, and I get so tired of watching him hit him. It's, it's, he could hit him, he just pound them balls, pound them. Not only was he a great ball striker and shot maker, but he took on some of the kings of the game at the peaks of their power, never backed down one inch. He was a street fighter and a scrapper and a, and a guy who would get in your face and beat you. And he took that sort of attitude to the golf course. In golf history, the, there are certain years that are always talked about. Jones in 30, Nelson in 45, Hogan 53. But almost equal to those was Trevino in 71. It began in June at the US Open at Marion outside Philadelphia. After 72 holes, Trevino and Jack Nicklaus were tied. At the press conference that evening, I said, fellas, you already have your headlines written. Nicholas beats Trevino. And I said, my chances are good. Lee Trevino certainly wasn't afraid of Nicholas, but he's, he's never been afraid of anybody. He knew that over a period of time, Jack Nicholas was the better player. But in head-to-head -head competition, he was just playing again at Tennyson Park. Prior to their 18-hole playoff, Trevino couldn't resist being Trevino. My glove was all wet, sweated out, so I went into the big pocket to get another glove on the first tee. And Lee reaches in his bag, gets this rubber snake out, and says, hey, Jack, and flips it to him. And it kind of broke the ice. Trevino will tell you he was very, very nervous. He, he did the snake as a kind of a little, as a little joke. The rubber snake was one of his kid snakes was in his bag, and I told him to toss it over to me, and he tossed it over to me. That was basically it. That did not have one single effect on the game whatsoever. It was just a fun thing on the first tee, and they just started off and played. I was very nervous, very nervous. I bogeyed the first hole right off the bat. Jack went for the green and two, but he's in a bunker. And that ball didn't get to the green. That tournament was decided by me. I took two to get out of the bunker on two and two to get out of the bunker on three, and I got myself behind. And when I left the third hole, I says, he may be choking worse than I am. <laughs> there it is, the United States Open champion, Lee Trevino. Trevino had already won and opened, but this was against the great man, and he beat him head to head, and then rolled on through that summer. Two weeks later, he won the Canadian Open in a playoff. Then set his sights on England's Royal Birkdale and a British Open crown. After winning the Canadian Open four days earlier, and we all thought, well, this fella's going to fall over. You know, he's he just going to be too tired. On the tee, Lee Trevino. <laughs> <laughs> and the other uh, top golfer there, man from Taiwan, Mr. Lu Yang Wan, everybody knew him as Mr. Lu, and he wore a little pork pie hat. And he and Lee battled the, right down to the end. On to the 17th tee, Trevino three-stroke lead, whacks his drive into the left sand hill. And it looked as if, he, as if he'd sort of blown it there. One of the few shots he hit offline. And I took a whack at it, and I moved the ball, and it moved backwards. I took another whack at it, and I got it out. I made double bogey seven. Mr. Lou, having hit a pretty good second shot, is ready to chip close. If he can get down in a chip and a putt, Mr. Lou would uh, be level. Too happy with that one. Mr. Liu takes two more to get down, and 
Trevino, having thought that he was going to lose all his three-stroke lead, in fact walked to the 18th with a one-stroke lead. Trevino closed out Mr. Liu on the last hole. I was so quick at the time and so much, so full of confidence that I put my ball down, didn't even line it up. I took my stance and knocked it in the hole. And there it is. The hat trick unparalleled in the annals of golf. You win three National Open titles in a month, that's pretty good going. I don't think anybody's ever done it, and maybe nobody ever will. Named PGA Player of the Year in 1971, Trevino was the most sought-after personality in the game, but he paid a high price for his celebrity. He was a selfish competitor, a selfish tour pro, a selfish, ambitious champion. If he had any drawback, his drawback was that he he played too much golf and was on the tour too much and didn't pay close enough attention to his kids. I think it's extremely difficult to be a genius, so to speak, to be a very gifted person and have a calling and then at the same time have a family and have people who are depending on you. It was nothing for me to be gone six, seven, eight weeks at a time without even coming home and seeing my children, talk to them on the phone. And I never realized you know, I'm, I'm just too dumb to realize what I was doing. Growing up, he was, you know, he was like a salesman. Remember dad being gone a lot, but, you know, not, uh, not knowing how every other family runs, just thought that's how it was supposed to be. Every day I got a, an off day, I would play golf. I, I wasn't taking the kid to the zoo or, or doing this or doing that. I was very selfish on my part, and that's the one thing that I regret most of all. He had to do what he had to do. It didn't hurt me, and it didn't hurt him. We're okay today. And, um, and I think we're closer today than we would have been if it was a different life, if I was at home with him all the time. Everyone has someone that drives them. See, Jack drove me. I could get up for Jack. I could have pneumonia, anything. If I was teamed with Jack, I'm fine, man. Let's play. Muirfield in 72 was one that uh, uh, I remember, because I, I mean, I'd won the first two legs of the Grand Slam. And people were beginning to wonder, can somebody sweep the, uh, the four majors in one year? In the final round, Trevino, Nicholas, and Tony Jacklin battled for the British Open Championship. Nicholas was just continually sending messages back to them saying, you better look at me, fellows. Uh, I'm playing very well, and I'm determined to try and catch you. Six to six for Jack Nicholas, and it might have been 62. After Nicholas finished, he was coming off 18, and I remember his caddy saying to him, Trevino's blown because Trevino was chopping it around on the 17th hole. He'd gone in the pot bunker with the tee shot, and then he came out sideways, and then he hooked it again, and then he goes over the green. I am so mad now that I'm walking 100 miles an hour now. To all intents and purposes, he thought he'd had it. He was gone. He was dead. Trevino turned to Jacqueline after Jacqueline had hit his second shot and said, well done, Tony. This is your championship. And Jacqueline says, if you want to finish, she says, go ahead, don't worry about it. I walked over there, I pulled the club out, took my 99, one waggle, poop. All of a sudden, this roar goes up on 17. The caddy turned to Jack again and said, Trevino chipped in. And Jack said, he what? My immediate reaction was, um, you son of a gun, you're not going to beat me like that. Tony Jacklin now has got to make this to go into the last hole level. Oh! He was deflated. It, it was as if Trevino had hit him in the stomach, you know, and taken all the wind out of him. All Trevino needed was par to deny Nicholas his grand slam bid. Trevino really almost unaccountably won ahead. Plays with refreshing speed, this very important shot. And just look at the result, only about six feet from the hole. 
They said that as soon as I swung the club, Jack started undoing his shoes. And the guy saying, what are you doing? He said, I watched the swing. He said, that's all I have to see. And he has this to win the Open, which he does. Trevino proved he could win in any social environment, on any course, save one. I think Trevino's problem with Augusta had to do with his own uh, feeling of social incompetence. And he came to Augusta National, and it's a totally different atmosphere from any kind of golf tournament in which he had ever played. He came literally from the other side of the tracks. He had more in common with the people who worked at Augusta National than he did with the club and the club's members. So he definitely was, uh, was an outsider, and I think very much aware of that. And when you feel not welcome somewhere, you, you're not going to have the attitude to go out there and win. I think Lee Trevino was uncomfortable at the Masters for two reasons. He didn't like the social feel of it, and he loathed the golf course. His first uh, thoughts about the golf course were negative, and he never let those uh, change. And when you're negative about something, it's very difficult to perform well. Would say he could never win at Augusta because the course was set up for a, a shot that he didn't have. He hit the ball left to right, right to left, and do anything he wants to with it. And uh, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous for him to have in his mind he couldn't play Augusta. I've always thought, and I think most people think that it really goes much deeper than that and that his reasons are much more personal for disliking Augusta National. During the 1969 Masters, Provino gave us a glimpse of his real feelings toward Augusta. Lee was speaking in the locker room at Augusta National and he said something about the stodginess of the place and he just didn't really like being there. I saw a reporter sitting over in another bay, you know, the, just how the lockers would aisle and go back in. And Lee was just talking with a friend. And this guy's over here writing it down. I got irritated by it simply because I read the headlines the next day. And that's what, that's what triggered me off more than anything. It intensified to the point where Trevino actually boycotted the Masters and refused to play in it a couple of times. It took the greatest player of all time to convince Trevino to return to Augusta in 1972. He said, Lee, you're a great player. He said, you can play, you can play any golf course in the world. Why in the world couldn't you, couldn't you play Augusta? And he says, like the course or don't like the course, he said, you shouldn't be there. They finally realized that uh, uh, Lee was going to be Lee, and, they, and Lee realized they were going to be a Augusta National, and so they just more or less coexisted. But it was an uneasy truce. After a round, he couldn't seem to get out of there quick enough. Uh, I, I think he had his buddies uh, warming the car up. Uh, he, it was like a getaway car. He used to change shoes in the parking lot. He wouldn't use the master's clubhouse. I didn't want to walk from the parking lot through the practice area into a clubhouse to put on a pair of shoes with no privacy generate a lot of press, anti-Trevino press, uh, from the golf establishment. They wanted him to be comfortable. They wanted him to, uh, to play his best golf. But Trevino fought it, and he just, uh, he just refused to embrace the Masters. Being of Mexican heritage himself was kind of his way of making a statement that I'm not part of this mentality that uh, treats minorities differently than they treat the majority. The only bitterness I have is simply I was too ignorant to play them all. And even though I didn't like the golf course, I should have played because of the tradition of it and what it's done for the game. It's just a shame that he cheated himself and he cheated history. June 27, 1975, the Western Open at Butler National just outside Chicago. It seemed like every year we'd have big thunderstorms. You see this giant dark purple black band of clouds coming in. You know something's really bad is going to happen. 
three o'clock, 13th hole, and I hit the ball three feet from the hole on the par three. And uh, we were walking down in a flash of lightning right over our heads, really close. And Trevino said, Jerry, why don't we just sit down here by the lake and wait for it to go by? And all of a sudden, a bolt of lightning hit. And we were standing there next to the lake. And it hit me and knocked me out. And it hit the uh, hurt. I remember Lee was, he kind of hollered at somebody and said, hey, we've been hit with lightning. And I said, Lee, you OK? And he goes, yeah, I'm OK. He heard. He wouldn't tell nobody. That man was in pain. The accident would leave Lee with injuries to his back that would hamper him throughout the rest of his career. Simply another test for the resilient Trevino. He was worried, I think, more than anything. He was worried about what it would do to him, what it would do to his golf game. Uh, um, you know, would he be able to come back strong? Getting hit by lightning and going through all this rehab, I had lost everything, muscle tone, uh, body weight. So what I did was I started concentrating on what got me there in the first place. And that was hard work. Being Lee Trevino, people try and take advantage of you. And, and he will believe anybody, and he'll trust anybody. He will give you the shirt off his back. Um, and that's a problem. There's a lot of people there that get a shirt, and then one another, and then another, and another. I was mostly surrounded by yes men. I was making a lot of money. I didn't think that it was ever going to stop, which was a very foolish thing. I don't think, obviously, his radar was that sophisticated at the time to know when a guy might have been taking advantage of him. And I think it happened to him in business, obviously, a couple of times. He took chances in his life. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. When he had his setbacks, it was like, dust myself off and go back at it again. I've been here before. I had made a fortune, I'd lost it. I'd made a fortune, I'd lost it. I think it's a pattern. So I don't think that he had to dig that deep to keep being resilient. I think he realized resiliency was going to have to be part of his life, or he was just not going to have much of a life. In 1983, after two bankruptcies and two failed marriages, Trevino married Claudia Bode, the daughter of a golf pro. I took a job with NBC. I said, I'm getting a little too old to compete with these guys. And my wife says, you got to be joking. She said, I'm watching you hit these golf balls. She says, your golf clubs have no idea how old you are. His third marriage has been the best chemistry and the best situation for him. A woman who really understood his life and wasn't surprised by all the sacrifices. She came into Dad's life at a very crucial time in, in his life. He was starting over with everything. Entering the 1984 PGA Championship at Shoal Creek, Trevino hadn't won a major in 10 years. The certain types of golf course you get on that you know fits the man. And I know Lee could play that golf course. Just perfect on the left edge of the fairway. Perfect spot to come into the green from. Although he didn't hit it very far, but he hit it straight enough and he had a great, great putting week. The last day, he hit 17 greens in regulation and all the par threes and 14 fairways. When you've got that kind of skill, you're going to win major championships. For the birdie, Get in. three. Get in. Come on. Hey, Trevino has won his second PGA championship. At age 44, he's come all the way back. To win any PGA is a great achievement. To do it at 44, obviously, not many players have won majors after 40. That victory was his sixth and last major. In 1989, Trevino responded to the sweet smell of success wafting from the senior tour, where he found new life at 50. I think the senior tour was made for Lee Trevino and vice versa. The ultimate uh, gallery gabber uh, in that more relaxed atmosphere. I may, I may put it this way, right here. <laughs> I knew that if, if I was successful on the senior tour, that financial-wise, I was going to be set for life. His level of performance was phenomenal. It gave the senior tour the boost that it really needed. 
Trevino now lives in North Dallas with his wife and their two children, only three miles from the shack he originally grew up in. His life has come full circle, only the house is bigger this time around. I'll tell you what I like now, is I like to stay home, which I used to not do that. Now, I'll walk around the house all the time. I'm looking for somebody to talk to now. <laughs> He's not caught up in his own life anymore. He doesn't have to go and practice seven hours a day to try and become successful. He maybe is, is getting close to being at peace with himself. He wished he could have done this with his first families, and it didn't, it didn't happen. But he really, is, I think he's really having fun being a dad. He's learned along the way a lot about himself, about the world, and about what it takes to uh, make a happy life, uh, not only on the golf course, but uh, everywhere in life. He's the American dream. He, he proves very simply that if you keep trying, you take the good with the bad, something good's gonna come back to you. I've lived a pretty hard life, but the Lord gave me a talent, and I didn't wanna let him down. And uh, I hope he remembers it.